Today is the third Sunday after Easter, or the third Sunday of the Easter season, more properly spoken. And uh, it's one of the wonderful little occasions that we have every year to look forward to because this is what we call Good Shepherd Sunday, where we focus on that comforting image not only of Jesus being the one who rose from the dead in order to save us from our sins, but we focus also on Jesus being our Good Shepherd who still remains with us today, tending his flock and feeding his sheep through his gracious word. And so that's the theme we'll focus on today at Holy Trinity. We'll begin by praying for the Lord to bless our worship. O Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray that you open our hearts by your Holy Spirit so that through the preaching of your word, we may be taught to repent of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and death, and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Christ's sake. Amen. We will sing our first hymn, The King, the Lord's My Shepherd, I'll Not Want. Let us confess our sins before God and pray. We poor sinners confess to you, O God, not only that we have been conceived and born in sin, but also that throughout life we have often and in many ways offended you, our Lord and Maker, in thought, word, and deed. In your perfect justice you should reject and condemn us for all eternity. Therefore, we come before you with sorrowful hearts, dreading your holy justice, and terrorized by everlasting death. Our sins are a great enemy, and we should hate them in every way as long as we live. But, merciful God, you still grant us in this hour to be reminded of your fatherly goodness. According to the promise of your word, we run to you, our infinitely merciful God, for refuge. We pray to you for the sake of Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, our brother, who was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. We beg you, dearest Father, to forgive our sins through faith, which the Holy Spirit increases in our hearts, so we are fully assured of your grace. Therefore, pray you, O Lord, through your servant, to declare to us the forgiveness of all our sins. We poor sinners are willing to forgive all who have offended against us. We earnestly desire to grow in true godliness. Help us, O God, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Hear the holy and comforting word of our Lord. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. And may God comfort you through this forgiveness in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, out of your fatherly goodness, you have been mindful of us poor, miserable sinners. You gave your beloved Son to be our good shepherd, to nourish us by his word and defend us from sin, death, and the devil. We ask you to grant us your Holy Spirit to assure us that this good shepherd is still helping us through our afflictions and comforting us in all our needs. We pray this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our living Lord, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. 
Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God speaks to us through the words of St. John's Gospel, the 10th chapter, beginning with the 11th verse. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired man, who is not a shepherd, does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep, and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the sheep and scatters them. Because he works for money, he does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I also have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. There will be one flock and one shepherd. This is God's word. We pray, Heavenly Father, sanctify us through the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. If you are going to be a pet owner, I've read that you can expect to spend upwards of $33,000 or so for your pet over the lifetime of owning that pet. And when I read that number in the tens of thousands of dollars, 33000 that seemed a little high to me at first. But then I thought about how much people really invest in their pets. There are whole stores dedicated to nothing but pets and pet-related items. And if you'd go to the store like this one, for example, and you would load up the shopping cart with special food for the pet, special toys perhaps, special appliances they need, cages and brushes and whatnot, I suppose. Uh, I suppose, yeah, over the course of several years, you would be spending tens and of thousands of dollars on this pet. And the amount of money you spend on something like that at a store like this shows what that thing means to you in your life. It shows what value you place on that. And as we look at Jesus as the Good Shepherd, we see this familiar picture of our Lord who places value on us. He's willing to spend many more than $33,000 on us. He gives his own life for the sheep as we saw during Holy Week and as we celebrated his victory at Easter Sunday and, and now we're continuing the theme of looking at our Good Shepherd, our Lord Jesus, on this very special Good Shepherd Sunday. And so that's what we'll look at today, the Good Shepherd who gathers us. And we're going to look at how the Good Shepherd gathers through this uh, Gospel lesson, John chapter 10 today. Now, the first point we want to look at is that the Good Shepherd gathers sheep who love to wander. Now, being a shepherd was a pretty common occupation back in Jesus' day when he told this parable. Um, it was a blue-collar work. It wasn't really fancy work, but it was well-paying work, I suppose, in that way. And you didn't need a lot of specialized vocational skill to do this kind of work. And the reason was you were dealing with animals who weren't themselves very smart as it's you know as it's told sheep aren't very intelligent you know it takes a lot of time and effort to train a dog to do certain tricks or to have certain behaviors and and uh, dogs are pretty trainable generally sheep are much less intelligent much less trainable than dogs and so it takes a lot more brute force to just compel the sheep to do what you want them to do because sheep aren't that bright. And so the training doesn't have to be done for sheep with any sort of subtlety. But that shepherd, that common profession in Jesus' day, simply exercised their profession by doing what the sheep needed them to do, by bonking them on the head and getting them to go down the path where they would find the fresh food and water that the shepherd was preparing for them. These are people who need a shepherd looking after them. That's what sheep do. And the reason that shepherds need to be around sheep and sheep need shepherd is because the sheep love to wander. And the thing that they wander to is typically something that catches their eye in the moment. Typically a shepherd is trying to get a sheep to go to a place where that sheep will be well fed and well taken care of and protected from dangerous animals. But the sheep gets distracted by something. The sheep sees something shiny off in the distance 
And then that's all that sheep can think about. Sheep is utterly distracted by the thing the sheep thinks is going to give it pleasure. Sheep wander after anything that catches their eye. Sheep. You know, I'm not talking just about sheep here, am I, with that description. That's you and me I'm talking about. We love to wander after anything that catches our eye. That's us. And that's why the Bible uses the picture of sheep to describe us today as hard-headed, simple-minded animals who are so focused only on the here and now that it's very easy for us to be distracted by any old thing that catches our eye. It's very easy for us to be a people who are not content with the things we have in our life, but we think to ourselves, oh, if only this were different, then I would be happy. If only I had more toys in the garage, I would be happy. If only my family situation would be different, I would be happier. If only the, my position at work was different, I would be happier. If only this, then that would bring me joy. We're a people who exemplify that expression that the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence because we're never content with what we have here today. And in many ways, anecdotally, this has been one of the benefits maybe of the quarantine and the pandemic that we're under is because so many people now being forced to be isolated in their homes realize a little bit more than they used to perhaps that in fact, the things that catch our eye, the things that we think will bring us pleasure, aren't always really going to bring us pleasure. And the, the situations we wish were different aren't really going to bring us a, an improvement in life if they were different. We're forced to simply exist in the way that God would have us exist with the things that we have around us because of this quarantine, and maybe that's something that we can use for our own devotional thoughts through all this. But the point is, in all this, what, whether it's the quarantine that makes you realize it, or whether it's just your own life experience, this expression down here that the grass is always green around the other side of the fence is a sheer lie. And you know it. And I know it. Because time after time, we have wandered away from the way God's word would tell us to go. Or we have tried something out of the ordinary in our lives. And maybe, maybe these things can give us pleasure in a moment, but there's really no long-lasting uh, joy or happiness to be found, especially when we have to break God's word to do it. And yet, just like sheep who love to wander off after whatever it is that catches their eye, you and I are still the same way, still wishfully thinking that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, and oh, woe is me, wouldn't that make me happy if X, Y, or Z was different? Well, the truth is, it's not. The truth is, you and I are where we are right now, because right here, right now, this is where God wants us to be. This is where he's called us to be. And that leads us a little bit into our next point. You see, this is really talking a little bit about vocation here. We love to wander away from the path that God has placed us into right here, right now. That's why being called sheep is a very appropriate thing for us because each of us has what we call a vocation, which is the fancy Lutheran word for the duties we have in our jobs and our relationships with others. Um, when I go through this doctrine of vocation with my catechism students, I always just, I, I use the hat illustration here, you know, that I as... I, I wear several different hats in my life, don't I? Uh, I, I have a pastor hat, and uh, I serve as a called and ordained uh, servant at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. But then I also have a father hat that I wear. And that's a totally different dynamic, where I'm a husband to my, my wife, and I'm a father to my children. Um, and uh, there's other areas, too, where I'm probably going to wear different hats because I've been called into different positions. I'm a neighbor to the people in the houses around me on my street. 
And so in each of those areas of my life, I've been put somewhere, and I've basically been given a job to do. And that job is always going to be rooted in serving others. That's my vocation. And my vocation is just like anyone else's vocation. It's that area that God has called you into. And we use the word vocation here because it's related to the Latin word meaning call. And we, uh, we get the English word voice related to it because you use your voice, voca, to call people. That's a side note. You don't have to worry about that. But I like that kind of stuff. So, so vocation, it's your calling in life. It's the place where God has put you and the things he expects you to do in that position. The, the ways he intends you to serve the people around you. And you can serve God in your vocation no matter what you're doing, whether you're an accountant or a tax attorney or a doctor or a nurse or a pastor or a teacher or a bricklayer or a McDonald's cheeseburger flipper or whatever you are. God calls you to that position. He places you right where you are right now and what are you going to do about it? If you're a typical sheep, you're going to think the grass is greener on the other side of the fence and you're going to start wandering away from that place that God has called you to serve in. And that's not so good. But the good shepherd gathers sheep that love to wander and he does it because the good shepherd is good. The good shepherd gathers because he is good. I talked at the beginning of the sermon about value, about how people can pay tens of thousands of dollars for their pets, maybe more over a lifetime of owning that pet, depending on the kind of animal. How much value does Jesus the Good Shepherd place on you? In this text, he describes the wolf coming and what does the hired man do, the hireling, as the old translation would say. Hireling's not going to put himself into harm's way to save the sheep, but the shepherd who owns that sheep will. So who is Jesus for you? What value does Jesus place on you as your good shepherd? He's no hired hand who runs away at the first sign of trouble, but Jesus is one who was good, perfectly good, good in a way that you and I can't compete with. Because Jesus saw exactly what kind of grass was before him. And even though you could certainly make an argument from an earthly point of view that the grass for Jesus was definitely greener on the other side of the fence, i.e., there's a lot of things he could have done that would not have involved him dying miserably by Roman crucifixion, yet Jesus lived out his vocation perfectly. He went in that path where he had been uh, placed completing the mission that he came here to complete. Jesus is good. He is the good shepherd because he placed that high value on us that he gave his own life to be our good shepherd so we could be his sheep. He didn't just spend $33,000 over a lifetime on us, but he actually sacrificed himself. He shed his blood and he died the death of the cross. And he did this willingly. He wasn't looking for the greener pastures somewhere else like you and I always do. But you and I aren't good. He is good. And he also did this lovingly. He did this knowing it certainly was going to endanger himself. And yet, his love for us compelled him to do it anyway. And that's how you know what love is. And that's how you know what goodness is. The good shepherd laid down his life for wandering sheep like you and me. And the interesting thing also about this text is that it goes on and talks about these other sheep from other sheep pen. Listen to this verse. I also have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock and one shepherd. And this raises the question, of course, who are those other sheep? And the answer is that the good shepherd gathers many more than just us. Jesus has a whole collection of Christians who he calls his own from all over the world, many of whom don't look like us, many of them don't sound like us, and yet these are people who are his 
they're sheep in his flock, even if we don't associate with them or we don't have anything in common with them. The one thing we do have in common is the common problem, sin. And that doesn't matter where someone's born or what language they speak. All of Jesus' sheep all around the world suffer from that common problem, and they have a, problem, a common solution to that problem. There's only one solution, as a matter of fact. Belief in the Good Shepherd who takes away the sin of the world. They need a common Savior, that's Jesus. And so that's as simple as that is. Jesus talking to his Jewish audience here describes how the kingdom of God is bigger than you Jews. You Jews here in Judea that Jesus is talking to, stuck in your ways, maintaining slavishly many of the customs of your fathers, whether they're good or not, the king, God's sheep pen is filled with many who aren't like you Jews at all. This is what Jesus is saying to him, to the Jews, that is. Jesus is saying that the people you're used to are only part of the kingdom, and in order to minister to those people, in order to serve them with this one solution for sin they need, the Savior of the world, that means that you're going to rejoice that the Good Shepherd gathers many more than just you. And it really does lead us to the next point, too. How do you reach those people who aren't like you? How do you associate with those people who have, you have nothing in common with other than your problem and its solution? Well, the Good Shepherd gathers still today using his tools. And you know what the tools are. This is a Lutheran church, for heaven's sake. We know that he calls to us with his means of grace, with his holy word, his blessed sacraments, the Lord's Supper, baptism. We know these are the tools that the Good Shepherd is still using. Just as a shepherd has his cane, his crook, that he'll bonk the sheep with every once in a while, through God's word and sacraments, Jesus is still bonking us on the nose sometime, reminding us of the severity of our sin, but also soothing us, directing us in the right path, and assuring us of his love for us through his gospel. That's what his word and sacraments do. God's mean of, means of grace, they're always showing us the way Jesus would have us go. They're always showing us the law and showing us his gospel. And that's the tools Jesus uses to gather. He doesn't use anything else. That's it. And when you use those words, and when you receive those sacraments, you hear the very distinct voice of the Good Shepherd. And there's not many voices to pick from, not in Scripture, not in his holy baptism or the Lord's Supper. There's only the one voice. The one voice is the Good Shepherd, the Good Shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. His call is clear. He tells you to repent of your sins. He tells you to rely on him alone as your Savior and to live your life out of thanksgiving for him. That's that basic law gospel message that's always going to be the voice of the Good Shepherd. And that's why he is such a good shepherd for you and for me. No matter what's going on out there in the world, his message, his love, his work he has done for us and the value he's placed for us, that all stays the same. And ultimately, really kind of the funny part of this whole thing is that as we still are tempted to wander away because we think the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, the good shepherd really is actually showing us, through his word and sacraments, the greener grass on the other side of the fence. But he's not showing us that as though earthly things are going to make us happier. The greener grass Jesus points us to, it's heaven itself. It's that final pasture the good shepherd is going to bring us to, where we won't be tempted to wander away anymore. We won't be burdened by the sadness of our lives and the disappointments and the anger and the other sinful feelings. We won't be burdened by the aches and pains of getting old, by the, by the disasters of the financial collapses around us, where we won't have to suffer through sickness and disease. 
but that greenest pasture of all is the pasture where, where we will be together with Jesus, our good shepherd, forever for his own gracious sake. And that's why you and I rejoice that the good shepherd gathers us into his kingdom through his grace. Thanks be to God. Amen. Having heard God's holy and comforting word, we now confess together the holy faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there you shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray together the prayer of the church. Heavenly Father, may your will be done in this world so that the governments you have established run well for the benefit of your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May your pure word which is taught by your holy church be preserved in every place so that many more enter into your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that you keep us in the true faith created in our baptisms, enlightened through your word and strengthened through your holy supper. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those affected by coronavirus and our quarantine, that you would place your healing hand on those whose lives are disrupted and use this event to cause many people to turn away from the pleasures of this world and towards you as their only savior in time of need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray also as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. give you our heartfelt thanks because you have taught us what you would have us believe and do. Help us, O God, by your Holy Spirit, for the sake of Jesus Christ, to keep our hearts pure through your word. May it strengthen our faith, perfect our holiness, and comfort us in life and death. Amen.